Hey folks, welcome back to the Hermit's Lab podcast. I'm going to be running six episodes on back-to-back weeks for the coming six sessions, starting with today. And I want to just take this moment to thank everybody for listening, of course, and remind folks that there is a commitment to accessibility that I have with this podcast. And so I've been working to make sure that there are transcripts for uh, every season, every episode, moving forward from the point that I took that on. And we did really great last season uh, in the spring where people pitched in using either Buy Me a Coffee or through eTransfer or PayPal, both of which are available in the show notes so that you can help make sure that everybody who wants to partake in this great conversations that are going on here gets a chance to. And I also want to thank everybody who takes the time to share, to comment, and to uh, even rate the podcast in its various homes. These things go a tremendous way to uh, reaching people, whereas all the social medias in these days tend to deprecate any attempt to promote that without money attached to it. And let's be honest, this stuff is worth sharing. All right, on with the podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Hermit's Lamp podcast. I am hanging out today with my friend Enrique Enriquez. Um, really, you know, I, I was I was thinking about why do I want to have somebody on the podcast? And, you know, I think that kind of in this time we're in, um, you know, is COVID winding down? Is it not winding down, at least in North America? What's going on? It's such a chaotic time. And I thought, you know, what better time to uh, have a poet on, you know, what better time to like step out of maybe talking about things in the way that we're always talking about things with details and facts and ideas and maybe step into this sort of other way of looking at the world as a way of sort of seeing ourselves through the next step of this journey, seeing a way out maybe. Um, you know, and all of those kinds of ideas. So um, Enrique has been on a number of times before. I will include the previous episodes in the show notes. Um, but Enrique, number one, thanks for being here. And number no, thank two, you, Andre. It's always fantastic to see you. And to talk yeah. You. And, and you too. You too, my friend. Um, so we talked a little bit before. It's been a while since we recorded one of these. Um, what are you up to? What are you doing these days? Is poet even a word I, you still resonate with? Yes, I I, 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 I will trust the wisdom of my daughter who tells everybody that I'm a poet. So now I have to live up to that, you know, uh-huh. just not to disappoint her. But yeah, I actually like that word because I think that word implies that everything you say is open-ended. Mm-hmm. Whether I, for many years, I made a living as a fortune teller, so to speak. Yeah. And that means that everything has to come to a to some sort of solution, conclusion, yeah. you know, something you give them like a pill that will solve something. Sure. And I feel freer, just it's just poetry. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, it's like looking at the I'm, I think a lot about the, you know, the line, the waves drawn the sand. You know, when they when the waves come into the sand, they draw this line yeah. that is constant, but it's always different. Mm-hmm. And I think that in a way, poetry is like that, or, or I, I hope to live a life that is like that. Mm. Well, so I poetry, think, poet works. Yeah, I think it's I think it's complicated for people to um, deal with stuff that's open ended, right? Like again, thinking about this time that we've been living in right? It has been uncertain and ambiguous, right? Which is not the same as open-ended, even though it's open-ended, right? Or maybe it is the same, I'm not sure. But it's been very difficult for, I know for myself, right? When is it going to end? Are my kids going to go back to school? What's going to happen with my storefront? Like, there's so many unknown things 
but that's not quite the same as what I feel like you're talking about here, right? This open-endedness. No, no, because, you know, I think mainly what I have been doing for the last couple of years is going back to the garden. I, mm. I keep waiting for something, which I never know what it is. But now I mostly wait in some garden. I go around the city and I borrow gardens because mm. I don't want to be a gardener. So I don't want to, to work on the, you know, keep, keep it. But yeah. I can sit there for a little while and just be happy. Mm -hmm. And the other day I was sitting at this garden and at the same time I had a bee landing on my left hand and a fly landing on my right hand. Mm. Was, and I realized that I, I couldn't be the same thing for both of them. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean with open-ended, I think. It has a lot to do with something that is generative. You generate possibilities or you learn to live in that realm of possibility yeah. rather than just not knowing or any complete uh, mm -hmm. um, panic of reality or the future. I mean, you know, I was talking to this um, biologist the other day and he told me that maybe the original language, the first like primordial language is humming. Hmm. Say, in, if you go to microorganisms, if you go all the way back before human language emerged, everything that was tiny hum. And then in, when you go into a microscope and you have microphones, everything is humming. Hmm. So I, I, I thought it was rather rather nice to think that maybe this life where we are uncertain, which is so anchored in our personality, it's just an exile from that homin. Mm. And then, of course, death is the return to the primordial homin. We, we go mm. back to that mm -hmm. line, which I find rather pleasant. And, of course, it's a little gloomy to say, but it is not open-ended. We all end in the same place. Sure, yeah. We all, let's say we all end back in the same homin. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe it's time to uh, turn in your uh, bird calls for a kazoo or something else. Yeah, well, lately, I mean, I, I, I mostly, if I could, I will stop speaking. I just want to chirp. Mm -hmm. I, it makes me very happy. It makes people happy, which curiously is not a notion that is really well aligned with uh, Western poetry or art. Mm. You don't listen to you don't hear artists or poets say i just want to make people happy there is always a concept and that sure. pursuit and sure. wanted to be the first mm -hmm. i just want to be happy make people happy and but at the same time i am constantly surprised at how if you take people out of language they find their own way back and that's the surprise so you could say yes it's something like like bird song is open-ended in the sense that you are not conveying any semantic content but at the same time that rhythm carries everything within mm. it so whoever listens to it finds that thing they were looking for so it is very pleasant and on top of that lately my actual conversation with the birds has become more active mm. so there is something there that is uh, I mean the other day I was just, I, I saw this bird I mean she was behind this fence and I started calling and he went down on the ground, the grass, mm -hmm. and then he would kind of crouch and peek with his neck to look at me and he would jump leaping around until he, and I, I, I just kept making the same sound. And finally he flew on the fence on top of my head mm -hmm. for a little while and looked at me. And there is something nice about thinking that um, eloquence could be just that sense of being able to sustain your voice. Mm. Not about, it's not about saying a lot. It's not about saying weird things or beautiful things. It's just sustaining your voice mm. so the other finally can find it. So, so the other has a nice place to land. Yeah. Right. Oh. 
sometimes. Yeah. But it's nice, actually, if you, you say it like that, I mean, maybe our voice is a nice place to land. Mm -hmm. I think so, right? I mean, that's certainly one of the things that I uh, really sort of appreciate, you know, and like people, you know, like I don't, I like being calm. I like calmer things. I mean, except when I don't, right? But like, but I think that sort of, having being able to hold that calm space for people right and to yes. sort of um make a space where they can make sounds right and sometimes it's not even about the words they say they're going to say a lot of words but it's about more about that exchange where it's like listen you can come you can sit on my hat i'm going to make yes. a rhythmic noise and you're going to do whatever you need to do here and and then you're going to go and you're going to feel changed by that situation. That is exactly it. And yeah, I think it has a lot to do with understanding presence, not only as paying attention, which we mm -hmm. always hear, okay, you have to be present, you have to pay attention. But it's about becoming a presence. Mm -hmm. So you become like a drop of water that when it hits the, mm -hmm. the surface makes waves. Yeah. And so you change the configuration of the space only by being there you don't really have to make an extra effort even to be noticed sure which i guess is part of what I, I feel in this constant retreat toward just being there like a rock mm -hmm. and now and then they say something but because also there is pleasure in it even speaking you know with, yeah which mold these sounds and forms with our mouth and then they come out and it's just so pleasant to do it, you know, to feel it, mm. the, the words vibrating yeah. here, humming. Yeah. But the, yeah, I, I, guess, I guess it's a lot about doing, just being there, mm -hmm. not doing much. On the weekend, I um, went, went out of town to the forest and wandered around by myself for several hours. And... Um, I didn't see any any other humans, which was lovely, probably because it, it was raining when I arrived and nobody wanted to go hiking in the rain but me. And um, your comment about presence reminded me about this experience I had. So I was walking along and I'm not making a lot of noise. I'm walking kind of quietly i'm looking i'm listening to birds i'm seeing if i can see the birds when i hear them and all of a sudden two ground birds shot off and i think they were pheasants but i didn't get the best look at them but they were obviously startled and i had no idea they were there because they were in the brush right yes and the sound of their wings not, not even them moving through the, the brush because they weren't touching anything. Just the sound of their wings sounded like something large driving yes. straight through the, the forest, right? And I screamed. <laughs> Maybe I squealed. I'm not sure which it was. Um, and, then, and then I started laughing, you know? And, and even that kind of presence, right? I became a presence for them, which was... Yes, of you know, course. You were, you were the drop of water. You yeah, did. right? And uh, yeah, and, and so it was such a uh, a lovely moment. And I think because I've been thinking about my my time because I arrived and I was kind of hungry for an experience. You know, I'd had an experience uh, recently, and I was curious if I could sort of recreate it or reconnect with that energy. And I was I was kind of I was aware that I was hungry for it, and that being hungry for it wasn't necessarily the best way for that to happen. And thinking about it as I'm talking to you now, I certainly was talking to myself, like, just relax. Maybe you'll have it. Maybe it won't happen. Maybe whatever. But, but I think that that moment where the water drop hit the forest and the bird flew off into the trees and I squealed, I think that was the moment at which I released my desire for that. Yes. And then That's afterwards, the, the experience changed not too long after that. Yeah, but that's beautiful. I had a, the opposite, in a way, the opposite experience a, a year ago in, in the woods. We were walking on this trail, and suddenly I just look up 
and I saw an owl mm. crossing. And of course, there was no sound. Yeah. Just this big thing, just drawing a line without making any sound. And, and I only, I mean, I, I actually told everybody, look, an owl, and they missed it completely. Mm -hmm. And I only saw it because I just turned in that precise moment. Yeah. And then we couldn't even find it. You know, we couldn't even find it, the owl in a tree or something. And, but yeah, so it's, I guess we, maybe we are not necessarily aware of how much we, contribute or affect our reality just mm -hmm. by being there mm -hmm. but we do yeah and perhaps there is then work to be done in terms of understanding if we should amplify that effect or minimize it mm -hmm. depending on the case yeah i was um i've started working on learning spanish and uh and i've been hey, bueno. gracias um uh, i've been getting together with uh, a friend of mine who speaks Spanish and um, I'm teaching them how to read the cards and they're teaching me how to speak in Spanish about the cards. And so, uh, so I'm, I, I would like you to help me with an interpretation on this. I know you don't tell f futures anymore. So, but whatever comes from it. So we were sitting there and we were talking with the emperor and I noticed and I've spent a lot of time in their space and I've never seen a bird do this before. So it stood out to me that a bird came and landed on their windowsill, despite all those spikes that are supposed to keep it off. Right. Um, it was a sparrow. So it could kind of weave around and it sat there and it was obviously looking through the window at us, you know? So what, what, what does it mean? What does it mean, Enrique? Well, it's, it, it means, itself right i mean it is what it is but i i think you know it's it's interesting because the emperor at least in the in the marseta you could have him looking to the right or looking to the left mm -hmm. depending on the deck you're working with and in uh, ornithomancy you know telling fortunes or finding scenes, uh, signs when you look at birds you have this idea that either the bird appears to your right, or it appears to your left. And usually when it appears to the right, that means yes. When it appears to the left, that means no. So I just see the relationship between all those things. And of course, I don't know if the bird landed right or left. To the right, but, yeah, to my right. Yeah, so it was probably confirming everything you say. Uh -huh. There is an old, uh, I guess, superstition in, in Spanish cartomancy that says that if you're reading the cards and a dog barks in the distance, everything you say gets reversed. Mm. Which here in New York, we never hear dogs barking, so it, it, we're, we're safe. Uh -huh. You know, it's, it's, I guess it's similar. Yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to, to think of you know, of that, it's, it's just a presence, right? A presence. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, a presence is in itself an affirmation. Yes. You know, it's the bird cannot mean not bird. Yes. There. So yeah. you could take it as a yes. And mm -hmm. that's something I have been thinking a lot. And it kind of freed my mind that when we talk about signs, Signs all only say yes or no. Hmm. Everything else is psychoanalysis. We, we move away from this, you know, harsh truth of the yes or the no. And we say, well, maybe a yes is not a yes. Maybe a yes is this and this and this and that. Hmm. So we use language as squidding to run away from the reality of the sign. Because truly, we can function like that anymore. I mean, not, a, I guess, at a logical social level, we can, we can just get dressed to go to a meeting and then because we saw a bird flying to the left, turn around and say, no, nope, not today. It's, it's hard for us to, to do that. But in a way, 
if you want to play the, the game of science, you are hoping for a yes or a no. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think that that's often what we're looking for, right? Yeah. You know, we have these elaborate questions, but what do we, what do we want? A yes or a no, right? Oh, and maybe yes. and even if we and even if we want to like even if we ask an open ended question, how will it go if I do this, right? Well, the, the the answer we're still looking for is, am I going to do this or not? Should I do this or not? Will it be good if I do this or not? Which is all yes or no questions, right? Yes. Well, I mean, we yeah, actually, actually we want a yes or a no in terms of how if the experience is going to be fruitful, that is in itself a positive mm-hmm. response. That is a yes, even if the word that we use to to define it is not a yes. And if the experience we, we fear is not going to be positive, then that's a no. Uh, but, but it's funny because I think many times we, we are looking for a yes or a no until we get it. Mm. The moment we get that answer, we go into the symbolic to minimize the impact because it's too much. To just or, the, or the psychological, right? Yes, the psychological, which I think change. Uh, the game in the 20th century that I have been looking at, at um, for example, Artemidorus, who wrote the interpretation of dreams in the 12th century, which is the one that inspired Freud to write mm-hmm. his book, or Synesius uh, Sirene, which was this uh, Libyan bishop in the, in, in the year 400. And they fundament the reality, their interpretation of. Uh, any kind of sign in, in, on analogy. Hmm. Things are like other things. Psychology or psychoanalysis changed that and we went to the symbolic. Hmm. So there is no real correspondence, visual, formal, between the thing we see and that thing it represents. It becomes uh, a standing for an abstraction, hmm. which allows to go to, yeah, to escape from reality into this inner world that is pretty much made of language. One of the conversations that I remember most from my time at art school was with the, with the head of the sculpture department, this guy, Ian Carr Harris, who's a postmodern sculptor up here. And we were talking about this prolonged conversation about metaphor, right? And and finally we, we got to we're like, you know, post-structuralism, lots of words, lots of words, blah, 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 right? And finally, Ian said to me, he goes, well, Andrew, what's the difference between metaphor and reality? And, and I thought about it for a moment, and I'm like, there's no difference. It is, it is the mechanism through which we can actually understand and relate to it, right? Yeah. And, you know, and I think that that idea, you know, has has well, for me, has permeated my career, right? It's been such an integral part of it. I think that that understanding is why I find Orisha traditions and their tendency towards proverbs and stories as being so deeply fruitful, you know? Because either we're going we're gonna to use a metaphor, you know, or, or a story to, to... It's like, well, this is like this story when this thing happens. Or the other side of the Orisha tradition is if you want a yes or no answer, here it is, but there's nothing else. Should exactly. I do this? Yes or no? Yes? Okay, done. End of conversation. No why, no explanation, no analysis, just boom, go. You know? Well, and I guess that's the, um, I do find something reassuring about that. I can see how the, the especially in the tarot world, which will be the, the thing at hand, so to speak, the movement has been against that. And many times when I'm teaching people, they, they always recoil and say, oh, but that's a yes or no question. We shouldn't ask yes or no question. Mm-hmm. So, but what else is there? Yeah. You know? But we are being trained to think that that's to be avoided. Yeah. Because in a way, there, there shouldn't be like yes or no questions. And, um, and going back to the, to the beginning, I think that is all... When, when we move away from presence or absence, which is yes or no, all we have is language, which means that we are in the realm of the imaginary. Mm-hmm. So, of course, it can go either way, which is where it's difficult, you know, because yeah. 
eventually you find the answer you want to hear because you twist mm -hmm. the words until they come around in a different way, which is the way that is more pleasing. But it's not necessarily, I guess, we'll say honest. Mm. Yeah. Well, you've been spending your time in gardens, um, especially starting this summer, the, the, where I live, they're doing work on the parking garage. So they've ripped out my garden. So I've been spending time in the woods for the most part or out in nature somewhere by the water and so on. And, you know, I've been having a lot of presence with a lot of very interesting beings and I have a lot of people ask me, well, what did, it, what did it say to you? What did it mean, right? And there are definitely ideas that come from that experience. But, it's, but it, as, as you say, is really about the presence, you know? I was, um, we rode out to, the, to this place and sat on this point out on the lake, me and a friend of mine. And we talked and we watched the sunset for like an hour or an hour and a half. And it was the most crystal clear of, of days and the water was stunning. Um, and the light, the way it went down was just perfect, picturesque and perfect. And this fox kept coming to say hello to us. And I noticed it first behind me. And then as it got used to us being there, and I think especially as we got quieter and quieter, as time went on, it would get closer and closer, right? And it spent the whole time kind of circling back and checking in on us, circling back and looking at us and so on. And what does it mean? I mean, certainly to me, it means it's a yes, right? Yes. It's like a big yes. What do you need? Yes, this, more of this, more of this wonder, more of this awe, more of this wordlessness, right? More of this, more of this, you know, with the person that I was with, this real presence and real honesty, right? Um, that uses yes. words and silence. Because, yes, to all of that. Uh, uh, exactly. In, in the, the fox becomes reality saying yes to you, accepting mm -hmm. you. And at the very end, that's what we want. We want to be part of reality in a, in a bigger scheme, right? Not just here and there. And mm -hmm. it will be silly to say, well, in the Lenormand deck, a fox is a cunning individual that is going to rob me or something. So now sure. the, the, the message you, 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 you will get from this experience is that somebody's going to cheat you of your money tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. That trivializes the experience and makes it small, right? Yes. But, so you just accept the presence. Also, I think that it, what has become very important for me is to be able to look at something without expecting anything from it. Yeah. Because the moment you do that, that thing reveals itself in all its angles. When you are aiming at a, an answer, a message, something, you only get to see the part of that thing that looks like you. Yes. You get this reflection and you say, got it, go home. Mm -hmm. No, no, that thing is not about you and it's more complex than you or more complex than you can imagine. So it expands your reality just by looking at it. Yeah. And I think that that's a, a big challenge in magic for people, right? People are often looking for a reductionist point of view, right? Oh, this, this is this God and this God is about this thing and I do this with them. Or, you know, the Orisha or whatever, like all of these things or the Fox, you know? And, and those things from my, from my point of view are completely separate entities with their own full scope of experience and presence. And so if I arrive to the Fox and say, Oh, you're a sneaky guy and you're warning me about sneakiness, but that wasn't its behavior. It wasn't being sneaky. It wasn't sneaking up on us at all. And once it realized we saw it, it didn't hide from us. There was no sneakiness. Didn't, sure. didn't try and whatever, you know? And I think that there's this sort of challenge where, Tarot or Lenormand can be a metaphor for the world, but the world 
isn't a metaphor for for those things. Yes, exactly. right. It's a, a an order of scale problem, I guess. Or well, or, but that that's a point that I think is very important. Like many times, you have people who they see something on the street and they say, "Oh, that is the tower. That is the sun." Yes, and it's it's a it's not not necessarily a, a useful exercise. Yes, because it's, it's important to look from the table into the world. Yes, that's an, an expansive gesture. Mm -hmm. But looking at the world and re taking it down to the table is a reductionist gesture yeah. that only trains our mind. I have a whole pet peeve about sigils because I think that what most people do with sigils is shrinking their minds mm. because you may think that today you are hoping for love or tomorrow you are hoping for a car but what you're really doing is taking something large and making it small yes. so in terms of our unconscious or whatever you want to call that thing the, the gesture is the same the, the actual name of things is anecdote so if you spend your life doing this all the time you're just shrinking your mind your spirit everything Mm -hmm. so I, I think the gesture is, as you just perfectly say, we have to go out and not imagine that reality is there to remind us of the cards. Yes. Because then we are trapped. We're really trapped on the table. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's a, a very helpful student tool. Yes. Right? What, what, what in my world this week was like the tower? What in my world this week was like this? But, but that's where it ends, right? It's so because it is a great um, tool to understand analog analogical thinking. You to understand the analogy between the experience you have and this image, or vice versa. But eventually, you realize that these relationships can be drawn in reality without using any cards. And whenever we understand the relationship between a discrete set of elements, and then we can draw an analogy between that relationship and daily life, we are divining. Mm -hmm. We are doing divination. It doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. So having to pass always through the cards is like taking one step back. And um, at the same time, I acknowledge that for a lot of people, they just want to play with cards. and that's Which different. is lovely. Yeah. It is lovely, yes. So that's different because then what I'm saying brings no solace. Mm -hmm. just want to play with cards and compare this card with the other card. That's mm -hmm. a different game. I'm interested in, 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 understand, in having a... Because you say something, I think it's important. There are yeses and, and no's in our... You know, as we walk through reality. But I don't even think they feed or they respond to questions. They respond to our inner dialogue. Mm. We, we got something going on. And maybe we can even put that into a question. It's just what we are experiencing. And, and suddenly these presences or absences feed into that. And you, you feel validated or not, or, or encouraged to pursue this uh, avenue and not the other. Mm -hmm. And it's an entire um, dialogue that mostly happens at a symbolic level, but it's not even something you can bring down to, to language, yeah. which is when it's very, it's very hard for most people. Yeah. Hey folks, I wanted to just jump in here for a second. Remind people that the Hermit's Lamp is also a store. So I have an online store and an in-person store in Toronto that sells over 400 tarot decks, 300 kinds of crystals, and incense, incense holders, candles, oils, and all the magical goodies you might want for whatever spiritual practice you are up to. I think we have great prices on stuff. Everything is sourced to the best of my ability to be authentic. And we offer uh, pickup or in-store shopping when it's not COVID in Toronto. And we offer delivery just about anywhere in the world. So do me a favor. Next time you're thinking about stuff, 
drop by thehermitslamp.com, check it out, see if we've got something you need there, because I always appreciate that support. It's, I, don't, I don't read the cards for myself so much these days, but when I do, it it kind of proceeds along that arc. So, I mean, like, obviously, sometimes, like, I use cards for business decisions, and I'm like, should I teach this class or that class? Flip, 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 you know, yes, no, yes, no, whatever. But But the thing that I do for myself, in some ways, could be described as taking myself from wherever I am in my head, in my emotions, grumpy because I haven't had my coffee yet. Who knows, right? And moving towards that state of presence, right? Yeah. And so I will do a quick, quick, open-ended, no question divination with playing cards. And then I will do a quick three cards, trumps only, uh, you know, uh, Tarot de Marseille. And from there, then I will move into this land of the sacred self Oracle that I made the, the surrealist landscape kind of thing. And then I will proceed from there into really what amounts to a state of, of being a state of presence, you know, and there might be, as you say, notions and ideas. And sometimes some of the stuff from the other cards will flow through and there'll be something to it. But really what I'm doing is I'm aligning myself towards presence by sifting through the day to day, my mind, my heart, and other bits and pieces, and documenting those things, and I, I never reread my readings; they're just journal process, right? Even though there might be something in them, if it's important, I'll remember it. And then moving into this state, and to me, that work, much like my my work with sigil magic, most of my sigil magic is working into that state of presence, and then. Yes. seeing if there's anything left right and if there is yes. a desire that then expressing that even though it might become wordless and 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 just purely well, visual i guess the, the the key issue here is how do we differentiate or separate signal from noise so we are around you mean we're surrounded by all kinds of things and then we say well but that's a sign is it, is it a sign mm. It's just, just noise. And for example, in, when in people used to divine with birds, I, I, I realized that they, their strategy is either to define a, a, a field, which is what they always did. You know, they, they drew a templum in the sky. So you say, it's within this frame. When the bird crosses the frame, that is the sign. Mm. Everything else is noise. Yes or they will have just specific birds that are the ones who give you the sign. So famously, we have crows, which has, they have a horrible reputation and people mostly dislike them, or they assume they are bad signs, bad omens. Mm -hmm. Then we have uh, pigeons, which are good. And then again, we have this almost infantile thing of white and black, which I, I resent because I have had fantastic conversations with crows. Mm -hmm. And again, it's like, it's really, I, I see, and I, I'm quite amused and also a little concerned because if I am talking to some pros in public, people get freaked out. Sure. They don't like that. So I see it. I see them. I see them, you know, they dislike the fear and it's all building this nonsense that they are birds of ill omen, but, but I understand the strategy behind it. You have to, to reduce the field where you bring your, your, you get your signs from. So it's only that bird, that bird. In, uh, in Taiwan, they have one bird and it's a little gray bird and that's the bird that speaks to you and gives you sign. All the others are somehow complementary to it, but they are not the sign giver. Right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and this is a, like a common... Commonality in many places. Also, the, this idea of 
right and left seems to appear everywhere. Sure. And weirdly enough, again, we have the idea of the sinister hand, which is bad, and then the right hand, which is good. But, um, but in any case, I, I, my, own, my own way to understand a sign is just the insistency of a form in time. Mm. So I could see something once, and that's okay, but it's not yet a sign because I'm not looking really for an answer. I'm looking for a process to engage with reality. So I need to find that thing again, and maybe again. And of course, it reappears to analogical pairings. I mean, maybe uh, now it's a red bird, but then, then it's, a, it's, a, it's a red uh, toy. Sure. Or you see a woman wearing red, and you realize, ah, this is, I have to pay attention to this. And that presence, somehow is in dialogue with whatever it is that I'm thinking, which is never, in my case, too practical. Sure. I'm, I'm always entertained with nonsense. So mm -hmm. they fit my nonsense and they inform that nonsense, but it's never about if I should order fish or chicken at the restaurant or, you know, the other day somebody was working with me on an exercise with the cars and they say, well, I asked the cards if I should ask something to the cards. He said, well, for that to really be something, it will be like flipping a coin to know that you should flip a coin. Yes. So you should do it for the rest of your life in such a way that you spend the rest of your waking life drawing cards to see if you should draw more cards. And yes. then you become literature and that's something. Otherwise, you become like an Escher drawing. Exactly, yes. yes. And you say, ah, you, you gave your life to this powerful image and that somehow can inspire or, or amuse. Or, mm -hmm. But uh, that sense of having to ask something, the cards, the coin, the, the runes, about every single step a person is going to take is almost like a mental illness. Sure. And, and it's also, I think very common that people start with that right yes. i mean i remember a stage where i was more on that side of things versus where i am now you know and i think that the, i think that a lot of these things that we're talking about they're almost like if we think about them as like developmental stages you know yes moving absolutely. towards presence right you know and i yes. think it's more like do we get stuck in that one or do we continue, you know? And not that we're continuing towards anything as such, right? There's not like, a, I don't mean it in a hierarchy kind of way or in a like overt goal, but in a, in a like, in order to learn, we have to absorb, uh, take on um, postures and things that aren't ideal to be sustained forever, but they're very yes. functional as a part of the journey. And then we can and shed them. Exactly. We, we outgrew them and then we yes. keep going. And uh, I, I think uh, that part is very important because we all start with the same questions. Yes. How can I do whatever it is that we want to do? Yes. And then we get answers. We, we manage the one who wants to learn the, 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 to read shells, learns how to read the shells. So, you yeah. learn how to read the tarot or you learn how to write a, a novel, whatever it is. And halfway, I mean, if you stop there, and that's maybe a problem that a lot of people have, is that they think that the moment they answer those questions, they know. Mm. And if you keep going, you find other questions that you can't foresee when you are trying to figure out how to do that thing. Yes, and, and we we all saw this because you start wondering how do I read the cards? How this is that? And then you go and you do a reading, and your your mind is blown because the other person actually gets it or believes it, or they they are there, you know. And it turns out ah, this actually works. And eventually you move into deeper questions, which come with a sustained practice. Mm -hmm. As you keep working, new questions arise, and in a way, you move on. I, I, I think that going back to something you were saying, I, I see now the, the, the tarot as a wonderful scaffolding yeah. for the gaze. Yes. You build this thing that sustains and teaches you how to look at reality. Yes. 
And the moment you acquire that ability to look at things, you basically dismantle the, the scaffolding, which is what people do here with buildings. Mm -hmm. A lot of people move to live into the scaffolding. Sure. Yeah. Because actually, it's, I cannot even convey this really, but where I come from, no, nobody spent that much time, effort, and materials building the scaffolding. Right. They're kind of crappy. Yeah. So you look at them here and say, somebody could actually live there. They're beautiful. I, actually, around here, they're like a more modern scaffoldings that sure. look like works of art. Yeah. So in Toronto, they, be... they, I think they, I don't know if they've been resurfaced in the building or what they've been doing, but the, they put up the scaffolding and then they wrap the whole building. And I mean like a 20 story building, they wrap the whole building in fabric. And then so people are inside, like in a tent attached to the outside of the building via scaffold. Exactly. Right? So, so it's like that. And, and you realize, yes, this is a wonderful construction, but it serves a purpose for a moment. Yes. And again, the, the, the main issue there is to understand that some other people are still at that level. So I, I try my best not to discourage, discourage people law for the tarot. Mm -hmm. excitement yeah. because we all felt that but it's also i need to to kind of to hint at the fact that there is more mm -hmm. that, that is not it and, um, and isn't isn't yeah. that poetry doesn't poetry invite us to see that there's more wherever we're looking there's always something more yes and, and in, in our stance in reality there is, a, 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 I guess, a deeper, but at the same time, wider way to, to interact with the world, which is not just looking at little cards on a table. Yeah. And because physically, if you think about it, if every time we have to look at reality, we have to look down, it's a little weird. Yeah. Because so, everything is out there. Yeah. But you know what's funny about that for me is, so I made, a, I made an agreement with reality at one point that I would not do this super open-ended interpretation, right? The red in your, your scarf, your, your pocket scarf is not the same as the Cardinal is not the same that I would not do any of that kind of thing. And that I would not look at um, numbers and this and all these other things, right? Um, that the only thing that I would accept as a sign from the universe is a playing card found on the street. Okay. That's it. Yeah. Only one, right? It's the yeah. only thing. And so for me, um, it's, and this is old, like I've been doing this for like, I don't know, maybe 20 years now, right? It's a long time. And so for me, when I'm in the woods, when I'm deliberately doing like, doing stuff, then I'm doing what you're talking about, right? I'm exploring, I'm, I'm open, I'm feeling the pattern, I'm looking and seeing what's going on. One thing leads to another, you know, metaphor becomes metonymy, becomes spiritual yes. presence in relationship to the, to the world, right? Um, but when I'm walking around my life, I'm not thinking about any of those things often. I mean, unless I'm chewing on them for some other reason, until... I see that card on the ground. I look down at the little card, but on the ground, not the table. And then I interpret it not as a yes or no, but as a, as a, a predominantly through their relationship to tarot cards, because I don't really read playing cards that much. Sure. And I, and so I go, go, go the opposite direction. Right. And I take that as a moment where the cards say here, Andrew, now it's a time to look at a card and look at a meeting and explore and understand what this means for you. So it's kind of, yeah, it leads to the same yeah. place, but it takes a different route, which I, which is interesting. Yes, of course. I, I know actually many people who do that. And again, it could be anything. It doesn't, I mean, that's like an actual agreement mm -hmm. to the science because it's, it's a, we go back to the idea how to separate sign from noise. And yeah. you say, well, everything else in a way is noise. And only when the card appears, that is the sign. Yeah. And I, I, I like, use... yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that it's rare, you know, yes. sometimes I'll find, find them like for a period of time. Um, but often it's maybe like three or four a year, you know, it's not a yeah, lot, exactly. right? Well, it, it and, depends. 
Yeah. Because here, here is, it will be a rare currency unless you're work, working on Chinatown. Uh -huh. Because you have all these illegal gambling places, so you find yeah. a lot of decks of cards, full uh -huh. decks of cards. Sure. So again, you can't say that it's a sign because no, you can you can yeah, yeah. you know exactly. with six right. decks of cards thrown yeah. on the ground because somebody ran away as a sign. So and yeah, it's, you know, it's a weird situation in which you know that is not that is just noise. Mm -hmm. Where we all the time we're trying to to differentiate that, and actually that's I guess the main question when people come and they ask you something, they say, it's not only what does this mean, but it's the, the, the first question in their minds, is this a sign or is this just noise? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the other thing that stands out for me in, in regards to that too is, so in Canada, we don't use pennies anymore. We round up or we round down, right? There are no more pennies. And so, whereas before we did this, you would find a penny all the time, right? Like they were, they they were meaningless currency that if you drop them, people wouldn't even bother to pick them up off. And it's like, yeah, it's just pennies, right? But now, if you find a penny, well, it's really rare because nobody uses them for anything. I have a, I have a, a pile of them in my house that I use for ceremonies, but, um, but, but it's interesting too how these signs change over time, right? Of course, and and it's um again it's, it has to do i do feel that it's scarcity is important and that's why for example people will say only ravens or hawks or eagles are to be used for divination because you don't see one of those every day yeah it will be harder to, to think of sparrows as a worthy sign because i have seen tons of them or pigeons yes yeah. but of course at the same time it all depends on the context because when you are in that situation where you're looking at this card and then the bird comes to you, yes, you accept that that presence is there. I mean, it's not uh, it's not just a bunch of sparrows in a in a cafe. But I had mm -hmm. the other day I, I had a, I have wonderful friends locally, so I was having coffee with one of them and I left, and she sent me this little video like a minute later. And I, I stood up and left. We were sitting outside. And as I left, a sparrow came and landed on my place on the table. Mm -hmm. So she decided that the conversation wasn't over. Mm. I had just changed my voice. And she kept present. She kept talking to the bird. And of course, I, I have wonderful friends who they entertain my nonsense at that mm -hmm. level. Uh, but again, it's not the same all the sparrows on the ground as the sparrow that comes on the table after I left. So a key to understand, to, to, to tell signs from uh, noise is that it's scarcity or it has to be rare. I mean, when you see a fox on, uh, in the woods, even if they are supposed to live there, it's a very rare occurrence. We, we don't do that. Yeah. And we don't see foxes all the time. Mm -hmm. So you understand that it's a presence worth contemplating. Yeah. Or like the owl, right? Yes. They're exactly. silent. So so not only can you, you know, you need to be not only there, but looking in the right direction. I had an experience last summer where I was riding along this bike path and I saw this giant bird fly across this field and land in a tree just in front of me and a small tree, you know, and so I slowed way down and I, and when I got within about 10 feet of it, I could see it was this owl and we just sat there for, I don't, I don't know how long, a long time, just looking at each other and, and then it left. And I was like, Oh, what a wonderful experience. And just that moment, you know, I, I was, we were both headed in the right direction, you know, yes. and our, our things aligned and we had our moments and then that's it. You know? Yes. No, I, I, it's, uh, for example, uh, I, uh, a couple of months back, I was uh, around Lake George in the mountains, and I, I realized something. I spent most of my time looking up because I'm looking at the birds or I'm talking to the birds. But every time I looked down, there was some sort of creature on the ground. Mm. It would be a mop or a beetle or something. So the entire trip became about remembering the ground. Mm. This idea that, yeah, you're all the time up here and looking for this thing, but at the same time, if you're not careful, you're stepping on something that is equally alive 
yeah. and it's down there. So that sense of correspondency or awareness became the message. Yeah. It becomes what I learned, which again, is not necessarily, it's a, it allows you to understand how to be in the world, but it's not necessarily a solution or a close, you know, ended um, answer that says, mm -hmm. okay, that is what I do now. No, but it's, it is in a sense, right? I mean, you understand uh, that in a way you're looking here, but there's something going on there. And there's always this sense of understanding that our attention and even our intention doesn't limit nor define reality. Reality is way bigger than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in some ways, I think reality is an invitation to be bigger. Yes, exactly. Right. So that's, yeah, because the other day I had, a, I had to walk with this friend of mine who was really upset for a couple of days. And uh, I, when I say goodbye to him, I, I walk back home and I notice uh, and, uh, the sign in, on, a, on, a, on a wall that was uh, advertising for a beer. And the, the brand or the image of the beer was, uh, was a badger. So it was like the head of the badger with the, the mouth open. And, and I thought, is this an odd brand for a beer? But I guess they ran out of pirates or whatever. Sure. So I kept walking. And then I saw another big head of a badger on the back of this truck. And that turned out to be uh, the image for a company that drills. Okay. The ground. So it's like badger. Right. And I, I saw it, I, I thought to myself, well, I mean, it became a sign mm -hmm. because it's not something I saw once, but it came back to me. And because when you're looking at signs this way, time doesn't move in a linear way. It allowed me to understand my friend. Mm. So I texted him and explained to him, I saw this and I saw that, and you are the badger. Mm -hmm because he actually spent two days badgering, not me, because I was just listening, but everybody else in his life. And I think that the key there is that the moment you, you grab that sign and you say, as he did, yes, I, I am the badger. The moment you take it, there is the implicit idea that you can let it go. Mm. So you okay. can be the badger today not necessarily tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And and I think that in, in that sense, it, it was useful for him. But I, I, I guess I'm in this weird situation in which even if people expect me to give them that, I am at the mercy of chance. I didn't know what to tell him. I just listened to him and eventually I got two badgers in a row and I say, okay, this is what I'm yeah. So I'm, 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 I wait, and I, in a way, uh, I, I, I don't think I can really. I notice things if I notice them. Actually, my modus operandi is to wait until something happens. If it makes like the the, the bee and the fly, if I manage to put that in language, if I can write it down way that it conveys what it was I pass it along yeah so my daily work is that I look at something if I can present it in language I pass it along to different people randomly in the sense that it will be the people who come across me that day you know whether go to me send me a message and that is the, the sign of I'm giving you this open yeah. thing, which is not a, an image or a close thing. It's just a sentence, usually a description of a situation. Well, they're part and of the signal, course. right? Of course. Yeah. And they become, and then they are set in place by the other person. The other person take that thing, which is open-ended again, mm -hmm. and defines, okay, that fits in my context this way. And it's, it's fantastic because fantastic because for me is different every time even the same thing that i'm describing is different for two three ten twenty people and it's similar when i i 
usually only do it on the weekends now that I go around, I take a big a long walk with my daughter, and then I record myself talking like a bird. Mm. And I send that, I share that with people, and uh, everybody who wants to actually get my bird messages just have to message me and I will remember them. Mm -hmm. But then, and you should I do that. It's, it's a lovely thing to arrive in your inbox. Yeah, so it, it appears in your inbox out of nowhere, and you're not expecting that. So it redefines your reality for a moment. You say, oh, this came right when I was doing this or that. Um, so actually, I just remember something that I thought was really lovely. This friend of mine told me that there's this lady in her town that they call the blessing lady. Okay. And this is a homeless woman. And she will throw blessings at you or curses because you can have one without the other. So, but the way she does it is that she speaks to her hand and then she flings the sentence at you as if the, the words were some sort of object, which yeah. I think is absolutely brilliant. Mm. So I asked my, my, my friend, okay, but can you give me an example of the things she said? And she said, well, one time she told me, the asphalt is as hot as the sun. Be aware of the number seven and cell phones. And of course it's okay, whatever. And I, I, I realized that that lady just right there she drew the perfect class on how to look or find signs. Because the first half of the equation says the asphalt is like the sun. Yes. So she's saying it's all about understanding the relationship, analogical relationship between things that feel or look the same. So you could say the alpha, the asphalt is to the sun as the number seven is to x mm. and the point of the operation is to find the value of x yes and now you have the awareness of this uh, for example again going back to the badger i'm looking at this weird beard that has a badger in it and now i became aware of that form in such a way that i'm more prone to recognize it again if i see it and that i think is mainly what happens with cards or that kind of work Mm -hmm. we, we find an image on the table and by image, I don't necessarily mean the tower or the emperor. I mean, the, the, the construct that we sure. arrive at when we see these things. And now we became aware of that image in such a way that we can recognize it when we find it again. And as we find it again, it's never the same. So that new incarnation of that image expand what we understood about the first one and vice versa. And then we find it again and that understanding get expanded in time. So we are truly in a dialogue with reality. Yeah. And, and I think that the beauty of this is that when you find this recurrency of a form, what you really find is a rhythm. And that rhythm is like the song of a bird. There's no difference. Or it's like the sun going yeah, around, making the asphalt thing. cold, letting the asphalt cool down, making the asphalt hot, letting yes. the asphalt cool down. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe that's the perfect place to leave it for today. Go ahead and go ahead and look at the asphalt, people. See what happens. Yes. Solve for X. What is it? Let us know. Yes. Mm -hmm. Such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank Always. you. You too. Um, for people who want to find you, who want to receive your lovely bird conversations, where do they well, where do they hunt you down? Well, I, I'm only on Facebook. I don't post or share much, but I am there. So if you send me a message, I will basically know you or be aware of you. And then when when I make a bird message, I will I will yeah happily send it to you. Perfect. Yeah, so good. All right. Well, thank you so much. It's been a it's been a delight as always. Same here. Thank you.
Well, folks, I hope you really enjoyed that podcast. Uh, I certainly always love getting to talk to Enrique and, uh, you know, find out what they're up to and, you know, often rediscover more about what I'm up to in those conversations. Uh, do me a favor at the end of this episode. Uh, as mentioned in the beginning, please do go check out supporting the transcription process so that everybody can partake in these conversations and, you know, give it a share, give it a like, do those things, right? Go back and reshare it with people and let people you know who would be interested in this about it because I think these conversations are important. I think a lot of these conversations that we're having on this podcast are rare and uh, and I think they need to be out there in the world. And really the only way that gets to happen these days is by you lovely listeners sharing and helping other people discover this stuff. All right. I'll be back next week to uh, have a conversation with Auntie Kay of the Land Back Tarot discussing uh, indigenousness and uh, tarot creation and all sorts of stuff along those lines. All right. Talk to you soon.